episode 84 talk and shop podcast and it looks like uh chad chop's beard is about 84 years young look at that beard how's it feeling today it feels like it needs a trim actually mm-hmm. i think uh you know I we don't look in the mirror too often i mean i don't i don't i don't think you do either and uh no. And so you jump on the Zoom, and you're like, you know what? I could break out the number two little peanut razor on this thing. And then you'd be doing a, everybody a disservice. disservice. A yeah. big mistake, because with all that fur comes so much wisdom. Mm. It's sage mm. wisdom. And I think everything that you say, it means more uh, when the beard surrounds it, if that makes sense. It gets filtered. It gets filtered through the there air. There is a filter, and, and, and there's uh, almost like the, yeah, the fur is. hugs the conversation, so to speak. There's it's it's an embrace. So that's that's, that's how we crank. <laughs> <laughs> that's how we crank up episode eighty four of the pod. Uh, spring training has begun, ladies and gentlemen. I watched a game uh, from Arizona on my TV. Cody Bellinger is a Cub. Kike is a Dodger. Um, and the biggest topic in baseball is see-through pants. Apparently, the new uh, the new uniforms that they're wearing uh, are are. I mean, if if you like seeing their jock strap, then it's good good news. Uh, you've been inside uh, major league clubhouses. What's your take? Yeah, these new pants. There's uh there's more balls than strikes. If you know what I'm saying. Oh um, man, yeah. I tell you, a, a whole, a whole new meaning to the term That's junk funny. ball. Whole new meaning, <laughs> junk baller. Wow. I, oh you my know, goodness gracious! It, but I, I gotta think this was done on purpose. This is a marketing ploy. Let's get more eyeballs on the sport. Um, I don't know. It, it very interesting. Not surprising, but very interesting. So we're efforting getting Brad on, uh, who's the uh, head clubby, great clubby, great dude uh, for the Dodgers. And he he gave me a heads up on this uh, early on, right before spring training started, where uh, it's just growing pains. Basically, they've gone from Majestic, even though they had the Nike uh, logo on the uniforms for the last uh, few years, it was still Majestic. So they kind of we're able to help with that transition. And now it is no longer majestic. They are on their own and fanatics has taken over and uh, majestics did, did an incredible job. Majestic was dialed. You could go in there. We would try on our pants. You could alter them, you know, any way you wanted to, and they would, they would dial it in for you. And by the end of spring, you'd have a custom fit pant uh, and your, and your Jersey, they would dial everything in. Whereas now they're saying, Fanatics isn't going to offer that service. Um, and I think the players union will get involved enough to where they'll, uh, they're going to make it right. These are professionals. Uh, the best baseball players in the world got to look good uh, and feel good to play good. So uh, I think, I think they'll get it right in the end, but right now it's, um, it's not great. The only good things you're hearing about it are from people that are paid to say it. They're from <laughs> Nike, <laughs> Nike endorsed athletes. Um, anyone that's being honest is like, this is an absolute nightmare. So I think they'll get it right. There's too much money involved not to get it right. Growing pains. That's exactly the way it should be stated. It is growing pains. They'll figure it out. Uh, but hey, it, it's definitely given people uh, something to talk about in our game of baseball. Yeah. When sometimes uh, the news is slow when it comes to spring training baseball. Uh, I'm happy. It's that time of year. My daughter just turned 10 years old. We had a great birthday celebration for her. I wrote her a poem, as I always do. And when when she has a birthday, bang, it is literally the first game of spring training. It's that time of year. So it's a beautiful thing. Uh, if if you follow Coach Ballgame on Facebook, you saw, uh, you saw a little something. Uh, you saw a, a little write-up uh, on my Facebook page and i'm just going to read it to you here it's uh, titled is coach ball game starting a travel ball team um i've been asked chopper for a decade to dip my toe into the travel ball world you have both feet and all 10 toes in that world brother um well uh, the time is now if not now when i think travel ball is a necessary thing especially for the elite player who wants the challenge but there are two elements of that culture that I'd like to see change. One, 
it's crazy expensive. Uh, and two, it's a toxic when at all costs culture that doesn't value character and skill development. Now, obviously, that's a broad painting. That's a broad brush. You've got the choppers out there. Uh, you've got many others, those of you listening to this pod uh, that are, are bringing the good uh, into travel ball. But the, the broad brush says uh, that it's when it all costs. I say enough. Uh, let's do something about it. That something is called the flying pigs. Uh, major announcement. Uh, I am I am partnering up with my pal Coach Zeus, and our goal is to find coaches across the nation that wish to put the coach ball game vibe into travel ball. What's that vibe? Affordable, positive, fun. A world where life lessons and skills are prioritized over a trophy. That doesn't just have to live in Little League or rec ball. That can definitely live in travel ball and elite ball too. If that coaches you, uh, those of you listening, our patrons, thank you for your loyalty. Uh, if you want to be that coach, then email my man, Coach Zeus, a.k.a. Danny Kirkman. He's been my boots on the ground in North Carolina for over a decade. Uh, his email address, write it down with a pen and a, and a notepad, danny at lexingtonflyingpigs.com, D-A-N-N-Y at lexingtonflyingpigs.com. He'll get the ball rolling for you. Uh, enough talk. Uh, we talk a lot about it on this pod. I think it's time for me to to throw some action in there. And you're doing that. You're acting on it. So um, one at a boy, one at a girl at a time. Let's uh, let's keep moving forward. What say ye, Chopper? What do you think? That's exciting. Uh, flying pigs. Uh, it's uh, great. I think it's great. I think uh, the more quality programs we can have out there that are doing it right we can overtake uh it's what's becoming the minority uh, in more and more tournaments i'm seeing is uh folks that are really starting to kind of get it and parents that are starting to get it and every parent that i come across i give them that kind of that recommendation of ask the coach if you're looking for a travel ball team what are their goals and if they tell you they're trying to win every tournament and uh win at all cost and they tell you about how many guys they've had that are doing x y and z run for the hills but if they say they're trying to build character and fundamentals, high baseball IQ and create good humans, then that is the right coach for your son or daughter. I can't think of a better role model in that space than you, Chad Chop. So uh, I'll be leaning on you uh, as, as we move forward and try and keep these coaches accountable uh, and, and just equipped uh, with the right tools to, to prioritize skill development and to know what you're talking about, know what you're teaching, but uh, also prioritize the development uh, of them as a human, which is just uh, huge. I, I read an article this morning uh, in the USA Today, and uh, boy, oh boy, uh, it it was it was a little, little frightening and uh, eye opening. Uh, it had to do with a brawl that Cam Newton, a uh, former NFL quarterback, he's now coaching and running uh, youth camps for uh, his sons in in the game of football, and. Um, uh, this was an eye-opening article. Uh, uh, go read it, uh, listener, but a couple of stats. 70% of kids drop out of youth sports by the age of 13, uh, mostly because of disinterest or toxic uh, culture. Uh, in a survey of 36,000 sports officials conducted by the National Association of Sports Officials, uh, this is last year, 50% felt unsafe while doing their job. Um, that, that's a hideous number that, that hurts. That's a gut punch. It can't happen, but it's true. So as much as we week to week, um, uh, throw this podcast out there and we feel like things are, are going right. I, I just think it's going to continue <laughs> to cycle where we're going to like a washer and dryer. We're just going to have to keep throwing that, uh, throwing that message out there as, as a new, uh, crop. Of, of parents and coaches jump into the biz. Uh, another startling stat, 50% of those officials that were polled uh, said that sportsmanship was worst uh, in the youth competitive travel arena, uh, in that uh, elite arena. And that makes sense because uh, the, the win uh, is a little louder and a little more necessary, so to speak, in that world. But um, yeah, when you read those stats, um, 
what do you got for us, Chopper? It's an interesting dynamic because every tournament we go to now, the officials are getting younger and younger. And you know, when we were growing up, it was, you had these like sage, old, like salty, awesome veteran officials that really had a ton of like wisdom. And you could tell that they were, they were loving and they were fair and they were great. And they were out there because they wanted to be and they're serving their community as an official. Uh, and you just don't see that anymore because it's, it's really not safe. It's not safe for them out there. So uh, now you're seeing younger ones. As coaches, we need to set the vibe to our parents. And uh, while I was an athletic director for a, for a brief spell in my, uh, in my life, it was about making sure that our parents knew that the official, first of all, we can't have a game without them. Like they're serving our community just as much as our coaches are. And you can't have a game without, without a referee or an umpire. And to look look at it through that lens of gratitude. And when you do that, you have more patience when they make a mistake because we all make mistakes and you're not looking at it like we got to win this game. No, you're trying to teach your kids how to deal with adversity. And if they make a bad call, you can still treat them with respect. And uh, I've had I had one last weekend where we had an interaction. Um, I thought I was respectful. He was not respectful back. And that was okay. So I just had to be like, all right, thank you. And walk away. If you, if you don't have anything good to say, just be quiet because those little eyes are looking at you and it is, it's on us to make sure we teach them how to deal with kind of all, all situations, especially how to deal with uh, officials. Yep. Uh, the, no matter what culture you're setting as a coach uh, with your team, uh, it's never going to be immune. Your day at the ball field is never going to be immune to a mix up to a miscommunication, uh, to an altercation of some sorts. Um, e even at our, our sandlot last night, uh, there was a discrepancy over a lost glove. And did uh, uh, did somebody take home the wrong glove? And uh, mine's brand new. This one seems a little bit older. Is it yours? Is it mine? And, and you know, all we do is, is preach positivity uh, in our actions at the sandlot. But it's never immune to things that can hurt people's feelings. So uh, I I think you always have to go back to the kids. Uh, it, uh, are we making it about the kids? Can we, can we put the kids first? Uh, if we're upset at an umpire, um, uh, are we creating a great a great day for our kids? If we're upset at the coach uh, because of playing time, uh, is it worth getting in a yelling match or a fighting match with them after the game? Um, uh, is that good for the kids? So, um, man, I, I, I don't have the golden answer, uh, to this. Uh, I think it's just a constant, uh, but every day, if you are prioritizing the, uh, mental well-being of children, then I think you'll act differently. And, and that's, that's kind of where uh, I, I, I go as soon as I see, um, an altercation or, or a miscommunication happening. And then for me, I got to make sure that I communicate with the parent and the kid. You whole, I whole, I'm wholeheartedly in this. I care. I care about you. I care about his future. I want him to play uh, for years to come. So I'm going to do everything I can to find that lost glove. As long as you communicate that with the kid and the parent that you care, um, uh, sometimes that's all you can do. Know what I mean? I do. I agree. 100%. Uh, we've got a great guest today, and uh, he'll be hopping on very soon. Uh, his name is Ryan Vogelsong, but his nickname is what, Coach? Goes by uh, goes by Vogie, and uh, he's an absolute gamer. Oh, yeah. Tell me, tell me a little bit about our guest uh, today. It, uh, what do you know about Vogie? How'd you meet him? All that good stuff. Great teammate. We met in, in uh, 2014 with the Giants, but he's just a, he's an incredible human, especially when you get to talk to him. Uh, um, he's, he's two different guys on game day. And I'm anxious to ask him about this. I mean, he, he gets intense on game day when he's got the baseball as the starting pitcher uh, from the jump. He's uh he's on a different level with just his mindset. Um, and an incredible postseason record. So speaking of mindset, I want to touch on that with him too, of like, mm -hmm. this dude, this dude was clutch. So clutch is one of those things that 
I don't think can be taught, but if you can kind of try to get into the side of the mind of those that have had tremendous success in big moments and just see if you can find some parallels or similarities of how they slow the game down, or if they're able to kind of turn down that care a little bit that bum talked about. Um, but yeah, he's, he, he persevered. He had a lot of kind of tough things, not necessarily go his way. Uh, so I'm anxious to talk to him about that too. And and his wife, Nicole, how impactful she she's been with him too. Cause She's a superhero. She's she's like our wives. And uh, and I know that she's been a tremendous support for him. So it's going to be great. It's going to be a great guest. A long time coming. This is uh, he's neighbors with Javi Lopez and Jeff Frank Corr. So, uh, yeah, this is going to be a fun one. I'm excited. Fired up. Yeah, I want to uh, unpack his journey. I mean, it, it seems like an overnight success uh, as he as he hit the World Series stage. But it was 13 years in the making. Uh, there was yep. a, a lot of a lot of bus rides and played in Japan. I want to ask him about that. Uh, and, you know, Tommy John uh, called up, sent down. Um, and then there he is with, with Zito and Kane and, and Hunter Pence and, and Posey uh, at winning world series. So uh, very excited to talk to him. Uh, you showed me something at the very beginning, coach. Uh, you got practice today. You got like a plan going on. Uh, if you're watching on so, YouTube, yeah, this is, what do you got? Yeah, this is just a glimpse of, of this is for the week. This week, we had our first majors practice last night. So just get organized. We're the Expos. Got the little water watermark on there. And uh, everything is time stamped. And uh, you want to have a plan. You want to be respectful of your parents and your players' time. So we had our first practice last night. It was awesome. It was great. First Little League practice for me. Man, it was great. Talk about, and our guest you, is I mean, you, here. You, yeah, you talk about being prepared. Well, our guest is here. Uh, Vogi, can you see us? Can you hear us, brother? I got you. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. Boom. Uh, Chopper, good. I, I'm going to let you introduce our guest today. I'm going to sit back and listen, buddy. I mean, this is a two-time World Series champion. Uh, he's a Hall of Fame human being. Uh, Ryan Vogelsong, he, he is just uh, one of the best. We've been trying to get him on for a long time, and uh, he's great. I cannot wait to unpack your journey, Ryan. So thanks for joining us, Vogie, and we're fired up to have you, dude. Thanks, man. It's great to see you. You're looking good, bro. Thank you, bro. Thank you. Right, the beard. Yeah. We were talking about his <laughs> beard, and and like it, it, it. You can smell it through the computer screen, yeah. uh, and and yeah, I was talking sure. about how whatever he's saying, whatever he's teaching with the beard, it just means more. It, it has more wisdom. Absolutely. It's facts. Yeah. I definitely uh, got like the Disney, like the smell of vision when I first saw him, like I could kind of like your, that essence you were saying, I could kind of, yeah. I got a, I got a whiff of it. So it's like rich mahogany. Yep. It yeah. Does. <laughs> yeah. Smell of vision. The name of this episode right here. Uh, <laughs> Vogie, great to meet you, man. Uh, I'm Coach Ballgame. Me and Chopper, we've been doing this 84 times now. This is our 84th episode, and he's brought on a lot of, uh, you know, just his former former guys, clubhouse guys. And and I'd love for you to start right there, Vogie. Um, it seems like everybody that comes on this pod, they love him to death. Uh, they love his beard, obviously, but they love his vibe, and and he just breeds World Series rings. What what do you uh, what do you have to say about that bearded wonder? Yeah, I mean, I fell in love with him from the first day I met him when he came into the, to our team before the 2012 season, and uh, you know, just getting a chance to talk to him and learn more about. The person just made me love him even more and his background and his story a little bit but uh, I mean what a great influence he was to to us I mean you know he had so many different roles on the team but uh, he was kind of like the player that wasn't the player um, he uh, he would give you a little stern talking to if he thought you needed a door and VP when you were shagging he'd pat you on the back if you if you thought you needed that you know I mean, he wore he wore a lot of hats in that clubhouse. Um, sometimes it was just needing somebody to drink a beer next to you, you know. So uh, he was uh, he he did so many things so well, and he added such a dynamic to our team that that uh, was was well needed a bunch of times during a long season. Well said, Chopper. Uh, I 
I, I was waiting to see if maybe a tear would come because you've been getting emotional here lately, Chopper. Uh, <laughs> when, when you hear when you hear uh, somebody you respect so much uh, say that, what, what do you feel? For me, it was just an intentional mindset of just being a servant. So I would try to come in every single day and try to make sure that I was available. Like Vogue said, if someone needed someone just to be there with them or to love on them or, to, or give them a kind word, um, that was kind of my vibe. It was intentional every day. It was like, how can I help us win today? How can I help us get in a good mindset? Who can I love on? Who can I be available to hang with? And it was, I did that for eight years, you know, and, uh, and loved every second of it. Every day I felt like I was in a dream because it was being surrounded by the best ball players in the world that are incredible humans. And, uh, and it, it was really, really, really special. So to have Bogey on today and, and talk about, like, like I said, his journey. Um, I'm really excited. And don't sleep on his basketball game, too, by the way. I mean, <laughs> oh, let's this go. This dude. Yeah, this dude will lock you up. Were there, yeah, were there some battles? Up. Were there battles on the road? When did you guys play? I never, I never had the opportunity, but no. But Vogie's uh, – talk about your, your basketball a little bit, Vogie. You got some cool stories. Yeah, yeah. Just grew up around Philly, so got to experience a bunch of the guys that grew up around there, you know, so – just, uh, you know, I could stroke it a little bit, um, getting your shorts a little bit on defense. But, yeah, I was uh, – basketball was definitely my, my favorite sport growing up. Um, loved baseball, but my high school team, our basketball team was extremely good, and the baseball team was not very good. So, um, my younger days, yeah, definitely more excited geared towards the basketball side of things than, than baseball. That was one of my first questions was basketball or baseball. And you, you answered it right there. It yeah. it's basketball. Yeah. I was, I was similar, dude. Like I, I was better at baseball, but like, shoot, man, every single day in the off season, it was two hours of pickup ball. And that, that was it. Yeah, for sure. You know, and, and growing up, it was a lot more accessible to go out and, and shoot basketball in your driveway. Right? You know, not everybody has a garage door, or, you know, a wall that works where you can play catch with yourself and, you know, throw the ball against the wall and get ground balls. I mean, you think it's it's easier said than done, but it, it really isn't. Um, you know, you, it's hard to find a place where the ball comes off right and rolls to you. So, just having a having a you know a hoop in my driveway was just easy accessible. And you know, I was the kid that had the the floodlights on out there at nighttime and just wanted to shoot as long as my parents could stand here and the ball hit the rim and dribbling on the driveway. And eventually, you know, I got told it was that was time to come in. But um, that was that was where I spent a lot of my days. The countdown, right? The three, two, yeah, one. Absolutely. Oh, dude. Absolutely. Yeah, I love that. Oh, yeah. yeah. I got the Jordan. I'm I'm born and raised in North Carolina, so a big Tar Heel fan. So I got the Jordan uh, uh, jersey in my office there. He was my guy. But, yeah, I, I'm a, I was the same way. Floodlight. Uh, it was Jordan over Elo like every night. That's how I finished my day uh, is Jordan over Elo and then into dinner. But, uh, you know, kids, yeah. kids and parents had talked to me about, hey, when should my kid get into pitching lessons or, or baseball lessons? I'll say, go play basketball. Uh, you want to strengthen your legs? You want to become an athlete? Uh, go, go play other sports. Uh, you'll have plenty of time to specialize. My first question was um, – uh, was baseball when did uh, when did uh, baseball uh, become a love for you where did it start yeah I mean no I say I like basketball better but I, I always loved baseball um, you know I grew up watching baseball with my dad at nighttime and um, just loved the game and and Cal Ripken Jr. was my guy growing up um, grew up closer to the Grew up in Gettysburg for a few years, so we were closer to Baltimore, then moved over to closer to Philly. So, you know, I had my love for the Phillies, but I was always a Cal Ripken Jr. fan and uh, the or and an Orioles fan. Then kind of switched over to the Phillies when I got to that side of the state. And uh, but yeah, just always wanted to be, you know, go to college and play baseball, and and you know, wanted to be a major league baseball player and kind of decided at a you know a pretty young age that I was going to do whatever I could do to to try and make that happen and exhaust every every avenue until that was over with and you know thank god that that 
you know, the avenues kept opening up and, and I was able to, you know, realize my childhood dream. Beautiful. Uh, you, uh, you attended Cutstown University, Chopper. You know who else uh, went to Cutstown University in Pennsylvania? I he don't. Is a I wide don't receiver hit, hit that, as a Miami Dolphin fan, this wide receiver crushed my dreams uh, on the weekly. Andre, <sighs> not Don Beebe, uh, Andre Reed. Come man. on. Andre We're Reed. Let's go. From the Chopper. Bills. Yeah, Buffalo from the Bill. Bills. All right, Andre Reed. Yeah, um, I mean, uh, Hall of Fame Stunt. player there at, at Cutstown, uh, and then you get drafted uh, in 1998. So uh, it, it came at you pretty quick. I'm excited to kind of unpack this journey because me and Chopper were just talking before you came on. Uh, as you hit the World Series stage, kind of seemed like an overnight success. Here he is pitching great, but it was a 13 year journey uh, from when it began. Uh, when you got drafted in 98 to uh, hitting that stage in 2012 to win a World Series. Um, just, just was there, a, was there a coach, was there a mentor early on uh, in the 90s, early 2000s that really um, guided you and, and showed you how a big leaguer should live? Um, so just let me back here real quick, just because I know Chapel loved this. I was a two-way player at Kutztown, so I was kind of like the Otani before Otani. Yeah, you were. Saying. Yes. Yeah. Facts. So played, played third base and pitched at the same time. So some days, you know, start game one with a doubleheader and then pitch the, you know, close the second game. So, um, yeah, played a, played a position two, still got the hit. Not, not the reason why I went to Kutztown, because my options were very limited, but Looking back on college, like, really glad I went there because I did get to play every day. It wasn't just a PO, you know, or just playing position. So very, very grateful for the coaches there to, to let me do both. And uh, what, how much I, – I, I just miss how much fun that was when I got drafted and became a PO. I was like, man, I really miss the, the other side of the baseball, playing defense and hitting. So just wanted to throw that in. I know Chop would love that. Well, and I want to say this too, for our kids that are looking at where they're going to go to school, like don't get obsessed with, I got to go to the SEC. Like, no, dude, go somewhere where you're going to get an opportunity to play. And like you said, Bogey, like, dude, if you can swing it, don't just go settle to be a PO because you feel like you got to go to some school that everyone's heard of. Like, go play, have fun and keep getting better. And it does not surprise me that you were a two-way guy because you are not like most pitchers. You were a freaking athlete. <laughs> an Thank absolute you, athlete. Thank you, yeah, buddy. No doubt. So that doesn't shock me. Doesn't shock me at all. Love that. Uh, I should have done so more homework, man. I should have known two way. Should have known that. So I, uh, nah, I get a B nah. minus on that, brother. <laughs> I like didn't, it. Hey, I, they didn't keep staff that cuts down when I was there. <laughs> <laughs> I was going in the archives. That's for sure. Uh, but, uh, um, but you, anyway, to answer yeah. your question was. Uh, my college coach, Matt Royer, was kind of the first guy that, like, taught me how to pitch. So I'd have to go there. You know, my high school coach was – he was a nice guy, but, you know, didn't really teach me a whole lot about pitching. It was kind of throw the ball bucket out there and have at it, boys, you know. So when I got to college and had someone that actually had some baseball background and knew what was going on, you know, I was trying to take in as much as I could. So he was really the first guy that taught me mechanics and – you know, pitching and how to, you know, try and locate and change speeds. And so he was kind of the first influence on me. And then through the minor leagues, you know, I was obviously uh, with the Giant, got drafted by the Giants in 98. And one of the first guys I met in the instructional league was Dave Rigetti. And uh, he, had, he had just retired from playing. And the Giants were trying to get him to come back to work in the system. And he kind of did like a, a week, come to instruct, see how you like the coaching side of things. And uh, that was my instruction when I was there. So I met Dave Rigetti and I mean, being in a bullpen and throwing a bullpen in front of Dave Rigetti and, and just kind of taking a, just a couple little bits from that bullpen. I remember walking out there going, this is the smartest guy I've ever met in my life. Um, so fortunate enough that they hired him the next year. And then the next year after that in 2000, he became the pitching coach. So uh I mean, I, I had a lot of coaches along the way, as you guys probably understand after, you know, 20 years of playing. But 
I would have to say if there was one guy that was the most influential over that, it was a, a lot of it was Dave Rigetti. 99% of what I know came from that man. How about it? How about it? And we talk a lot about um, a coach's tone and a coach's body language. And, and I've, I've, I've watched Dave Rigetti coach, you know, from afar, but uh, it just seems like, yeah, he would be the smartest guy in the room because he he's not getting too animated. He's, he's, he's staying pretty calm. And uh, as, as we do this podcast for mostly youth coaches and, and high school coaches and parents, um, we talk about becoming a savant of people and, you know, Chopper has brought on lots of those guys from the Giants clubhouse uh, and the Dodgers. But um, if you can become a savant of people like a Dusty Baker, uh, then, then, then you're, uh, then you're doing something right. So uh, Dave Rigetti, check. Uh, Chopper, back to you. Yeah, Rags, uh, Rags is incredible. And then we had Rick Honeycutt on uh, on the pod too, and torn from the same cloth. Similar, just wealth of knowledge. Um, yeah, just one of those guys, Vogi. You're right. Where you get in and and you just even if you're just talking shop with them, like they're going, they have so much wisdom. You're like, bro, that guy didn't even know that he really impacted you in a positive way just on dude, the stuff that's just on the shelf in their mind that, that is like, Oh yeah, you do this or you do that. Or he was impactful for me. Rags was on the bus. He's like, cause I didn't know, like I got on a bus, there's a hierarchy to the bus. Right. So I get on the bus and Rags comes over and like, Hey dude, like you got to move up a little bit. It's your first year with us. Like, you know what I mean? And I'm like, all right, bet Rags. Thank you. Whereas everyone else would look at you sideways. Rags is like, Hey, come on, Rook. Like you gotta, you know, so he's Rags is a legend. Question I have for you, and just knowing your family, you exuded like perseverance. Um, you, the, the game kind of knocked you down a lot, and you kept getting up, chasing your dream. How impactful was Nicole, your awesome wife, um, in your journey? Because she's similar to our wives, the Diesel. Uh, she's she's a superhero. So how impactful was she uh, in your journey? Yeah, I mean, tremendously. Um, you know, the I would say no, none more so than when we were in Japan. Um, so quick background, drafted in 98, make it to the big leagues really fast in 2000. Then a um, little bit of AAA in 01, then big leagues again in 01, then traded to the Pirates at the deadline for Jason Schmidt. Go to the Pirates, blow out my elbow, you know, a couple starts in. And then that's this is when the tailspin kind of starts and in everything starts to get pretty difficult. So um, 2004, starting with the Pirates, I went 6-13 and 13 with like a 6.50 ERA. And at that point in time, I was like the worst starting pitcher in the 100-year history of the Pittsburgh Pirates um, with like 20 starts, which I think I made like 25 starts. So I was pretty bad. Um, and Japan came calling, and, and I didn't, you know, not – wasn't the ideal situation, but I felt like that at that point in time was the best thing to help me get something going in a positive way. And um, when you don't really know what's going to happen and you just kind of sign up for it, when you get there and things aren't going the way you want, uh, if she wasn't there, I wouldn't have made it. Cause I never, there was days where I never felt so far away from being a major league baseball player. And uh, she really kept me on task, you know, um, you get to a point where you're just like this, this, this dream of being a, uh, you know, I had made it to the big leagues and I could, I called myself a major leaguer, but uh, that, I wanted to be a good major leaguer. I just didn't want to show up and collect a check. I wanted to be impactful and contribute to a winner and win a world series. And so those days when I was in Japan and that far away, like she really kept me on task. And when I'm sitting there saying, this is never happening, she was going, no, it's going to happen. You just got to keep going. So. Yeah, I mean, she, she's the glue, man. Uh, I know your wife very well, and I know she's the glue in your house. And my wife is definitely the glue around here and has been for a long time. Yeah, Nicole sent uh, Debbie a hummingbird necklace uh, for Christmas. And every single time we see a hummingbird, you know, Deb thinks of Nicole. So she, yeah. she, she loves Nicole. You know how much we love you and your family and Nicole and Ryder. And uh, yeah, there's, there's no way behind every good man, there's a great woman. And, uh, and I know she, I mean, she's, I'm coach ball game. She is an absolute stud and it's that vibe of like, 
so what now what like let's keep going dude like you you are who you think you are and let's keep going and vogi epitomizes that vibe so it's one of those things where i'm i'm certain every night you went home and she's like hey let's go yeah go be the goat and he'd come in every single day like hey let's get to work let's freaking go win a ball game you know um, and you know what's important to chop is when things aren't going your, your way and you and, and repeatedly i'm not talking about having one, one bad game you know we're talking about five six years of getting you know getting beat up and getting your butt kicked on the baseball field really um like it, it builds character but also like what 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 are you what are you like who yeah. you can be who you want to be and the life lessons that i learned through that and it's hard to see when it's happening to you but those life lessons that i learned and all those trials and tribulations like it helped me who i was and i call it the second time around right if I don't go through those bad day, those bad years, then I'm not who I am the second time around. And I 100% don't appreciate it as much as I did the second time around, right? If you just come out and you're good and everything's good and you win right away, do you, I mean, I'm sure you appreciate it and you're happy, but for me, it made the success way better because I had been beat up so many times. And to, so it helped me deal with the success, but also I don't have that success without, without those, those bad years. Yeah, I, I have a, I got a text from a parent who wants me to reach out to their son because they just, they're a freshman, they're playing varsity, they had a tough weekend and she's like, I don't know what to tell him, he's really down, but I'm going to say what you just said of like these moments get to show you who you are. Yeah, You, you know, sure. you can, you can kind of fold and feel sorry for yourself or you can double down on the process like I saw you do and it's going to make it that much sweeter, dude, if you don't quit. We had Longo on here and Longo was like, Hey, dude, if you don't quit, you'll outlast everybody. Yeah. Like you just get up, you get back on the horse and you keep going. Guess what, dude? You'll pass them all if you never quit. Yep. For sure. I agree with that 100%. Parents and coaches listening, look through that lens, right? When your kid's 0 for 30, uh, how about the life lessons they're going to gain on the other side of that when uh, the, the um, lessons of responding to failure and overcoming adversity um, I, I, I'm excited to get to 2011, but there, there was a, a few little things that happened before you were an all-star for the giants. And, and one was, like you said, playing in Japan where chopper, you know what he did in his major, in his debut in Japan, probably, probably had a nuke. He had a dinger. <laughs> Got him. Got him. <laughs> he had a dinger. What's it like yeah, playing in shock Japan? Me. That's what I want to know. What's it like playing there? Uh, you know, man, it was it was fun. Listen, I'm not going to tell you it was all, you know, rainbows and roses because it wasn't. But um, it was fun. You know, it's like the games are like a World Cup. The only time when there's not music or chanting going on is in between innings. So wow. when the ball's in play, there is noise going on. It's like being at a World Cup soccer game. It's exciting. Um you know, you could be having the worst game ever and there's still music going on behind you cheering for you. So, you know, uh, but it, it's tough when you're not playing the way you want to and you're and you're that far away from home. It gets a little difficult. Um, the one thing I had to adjust to was uh, if you don't pitch good, no one will talk to you. <laughs> so that was really that was a little different. Yeah. So, you know, you're talking I, teammates, I coaches, really everybody like all yeah. of them. All wow. Of them. Wow. Wow. Oh. So I had a couple really good games to start. You know, I'm feeling pretty good about myself and had a really bad one when I went to the field the next day and, like, everyone looked at me and would turn the other way. And I'm like, wow. whoa, whoa, what's going on here? Like, I thought we were pulling on the same road. But that's just their culture. Like, they don't – I don't think it's so much that they hate you. They just don't really know what to say. But I think they hate you at the same time. Disappointed. Like, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> – that was a little bit of adjustment. So what got got used to that and I'm like, well, I just gotta stop pitching bad if I want to talk to people. So um, but you know what, man, it was uh I tell people all the time, the thing that it did for me was it made me learn who I was, not just as a person, but on the baseball field. It made me understand how to make my own adjustments because when I'm in a bullpen, throwing a bullpen. 
and the Japanese coach has to talk to a translator, then the translator has to talk to me. And there's, you know, it's the movie Lost in Translation. Uh, yeah. Words just don't get translated right sometimes, especially with baseball. So I really had to dive into why am I throwing good pitches today and why can't I repeat this and why can't I throw good pitches again the next time? And, you know, I know you guys have both heard, probably heard the horror stories about the 200 pitch bullpens and stuff in Japan and they're true. Um, I don't recommend it, but I never threw 200, but I know I got to a hundred a couple of times, but to be honest with you guys, I needed it. You know, and, and my my point of that is as long as you're doing it smart and it's not every single time. And here's the other thing we had. We were on a six man rotation there, so we always had an extra day. So there was times when I was ripping 100 pitch bullpens, but I needed it. And here's here's my explanation to it. If I throw a 35 or 40 pitch bullpen and I throw the first 30 really good and then my last five or six are trash. And the coach is like, hey, that's that's it. That's 35. I have no idea why those last six were trash. And now this is more for a younger player, you know, 24, 25, doesn't really understand why he makes good pitches yet, which is where I was at. And then, you know, let's say it goes the opposite way where you're throwing 40 pitches and your first 30 stink and then your last 10 are really good. And now you think you got something. But then once again, like you don't know why. You just threw 10 really good pitches, right? And now you're finished. So the the longer bullpens allowed me to start good, get in a little funk, figure it out, maybe get in a little funk again, figure it out without someone going, hey, that's it. You're done for the day. So like I said, I never got super crazy like the 200 range, but I know I threw some 75 100s, but it allowed me to understand my mechanics to why I made pitches and why I didn't. And honestly, like people say, what happened when you came back? Well, I threw the same pitches I threw before I left. I just understood how my body was working to execute those pitches more consistently. Man, that, uh, that kind of answers my next question. Cause, uh, you, you climbed back minor league deal with the Phillies in 2010 and then friend of the pod, Barry Zito goes down and there you are pitching for the Giants again. And uh, I, I this was quoted. Uh, I read this winter ball in Venezuela in 2010 was the turning point in your career. Uh, can you can you put a nail on the head? Why? What happened in Venezuela? Um, once again, two, two mechanical adjustments. Uh, one, I figured out how important my front shoulder was. Um, one guy told me, he goes, hey, you know your front shoulder's moving all over the place? And I go, no, I, I've never had anyone tell me that before. And he goes, well, I want you to hold that thing as still as you can, like that's your aimer. And all of a sudden, I start dotting pitches. And then another guy changed my lower half a little bit, and uh, it was unbelievable. Those two things, like, unlocked everything, and then that's kind of what I realized, oh, well, when I was making really good pitches, this is what I was doing anyway. I just didn't realize what, what I was doing when I was making really good pitches. So we were in a, actually in a game in Caracas one night and same, same Vogel song skit, like pitching okay, but you know, walk three kind of deep counts, every count. And, uh, with this, you know, close game, it was like one, nothing or something like that in the fifth inning. I had get, got the bases loaded and kind of spraying the ball all over the place, like I said. And uh, I'll never forget the at-bat. Mer Merlin when G Gonzalez was up, the guy that was in Houston for a long time. Yeah. He was up, and his first time up, he hit a rocket back up the middle and almost took my head off. He's a good hitter. So I get into a 2-0 count, bases loaded, and I just stopped and took a breath, and I go, do something different. Just do something different. So I threw him a 2-0 hook and dotted it. And I went, oh. That felt different. So I go, I'm going to do it again. So 2-1, threw another hook, dotted it. I go, oh, man, I got something here. And I punched out the next two guys and got out of it. And, like, that's when everything changed for me. Because I just go, okay, I felt something on that pitch that made me execute the way I wanted to execute. And that's, that's the night things changed. Bang. 
Chopper, run with that. I mean, there's a lot there uh, for our young pitchers and catchers. There's a lot of power in what you just said of like, dude, if the guy throws four straight fastballs out of the zone and he's spraying it and you go fastball, like throw a curveball, like just do something different. Like go ahead and put a two down and let's see what happens. And to your point, sometimes that can sync you up and then it yeah. gets you right back in rhythm. Um, I want to ask you about your postseason mindset because, I mean, I had a up close and personal look at it. But I don't believe you can teach clutch, but like you had it. So I think we can learn from some of the cues that maybe you used in those big moments to succeed. Because, I mean, the, the numbers are there, dude. It's, it's super impressive uh, what you were able to do in the biggest moments. So can you share with us kind of what you did to be consistent in those big spots? Yeah, and I mean, you saw me on a daily basis, so you saw that my my regular day was that was the same as if it was a postseason game. You know, that's you, facts. You saw that when it was my day, that was my only focus was pitching really good and helping us win the game. So when I got to the postseason, it wasn't like I had to try and recreate or create something that wasn't there. That's who I was. But once again, this is a question I get a lot. And the answer, the answer is simple, it is focus. You know, I, I decided that I was gonna concentrate so hard on every pitch that I didn't have time to worry about anything else. And, and you saw it, and, and we've talked about it in the past, me and you, when we're shagging, like, I decided that I was gonna put 100% concentration and effort into every single pitch that night. So I didn't have time to worry about if we were losing, if I was going to let down this, you know, 40,000 people in the stands, if I was going to let down the entire city of San Francisco, you know, if I was going to let down my family, like let down my teammates, I didn't have time to think about that because I was so focused on every single pitch that everything else went away. And, you know, I kind of went, like I told, I told you in the past, one pitch at a time, like I threw that pitch and when that pitch was over, it was on to the next pitch. And it didn't matter if it was a ball or strike, it got hit. The, the only thing that was important to me was the next one. And then when the game was over or I came out of the game and got a chance to breathe, then that's when you go, holy crap, what, what just happened? <laughs> <laughs> and I love I, – and this is an absolute just beautiful thing for our young players because you talk about focus. And as coaches, we talk about controllables. And it's your attitude. It's your effort. But like focus is one that I know I don't say enough and I'm working with a younger group right now. But as you grow in this game, like you get to control that focus and your thoughts. So often players let their thoughts control them. But you're a perfect example of someone who learned how to, if this thought ain't going to help me, dude, and it's not helping in, in this moment in the present, I don't have space for it, dude. Like I'm out, I, you're gone. And you were able to take a deep breath and freaking lock in at the task at hand. Um, I, I love that. I love that about you. And yeah, you're right. I saw it every day. And on game day, coach ball game, bogey was locked in probably from the drive in. I wasn't in the car with him, but the second he set foot on that in that stadium, dude, y'all could feel just his intensity of like, Hey, today's going to be a day where I'm going to let it all hang. And, and it's going to be, they're going to have to rip me out of this game because Bogey was, it was different, but you're right, Bogey. That's so come postseason, you done it 35 times earlier already. Right. Um, but yeah. I love the focus. And yeah. I think the other thing too was um, you, you, you saw, like I said, it was, it's easier for you to understand because you saw it on a daily basis. But I, my, what made me confident was my preparation. And that wasn't just scouting the other team. That was my weight room work during the week you know like you saw it like I was pretty intense in the weight room for the entire week it wasn't just one day um but that's what made me feel like I was ready to compete and what made me confident that I could go beat the other team was you didn't work harder than me during the week and you definitely didn't prepare more than me and you're not going to out focus me so you're already you're already losing when this game starts so those were the those were the things that that drove me and what I didn't understand as a younger major league player that I understood as an older player. And then I said, some of that came from, you know, losing and, and getting beat down. Some of that came from Japan, but 
once I kind of figured out what made me work, then it, it, it didn't get, it wasn't easy, but it made it a lot easier. But the preparation yeah. was definitely key for me. Confidence through preparation. I remember leading up to my draft year, I, it was 150 swings a night, seven days a week in my backyard and on top of everything else, full-time job, four hours in the gym, a, a team practice with my college team. Uh, but I was going to, I was going to outwork everybody Vogie. And I got in that batter's box every single time I stepped in the box, I could look out to the mound and know with certainty that I outworked this dude and he's about to get embarrassed. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was, I wouldn't say I was crazy, but I was a little crazy where I would even stand in the dugout the night before I was going to pitch and look across the field in the other dugout. And if their guy was that I was going to pitch against was over there joking around, I'm like, you already lost. You already lost because I'm already I'm already ready for tomorrow. And you're over there clowning around like you're not ready for tomorrow. And he probably he that that was just him. Right. But that gave me confidence. Like, got him. I got him already. Yeah. I love the line. You didn't have time to think about the negative. And as 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 a youth coach, um, uh, that's that maybe is our number one job you know you, you say you can't teach clutch but you can definitely nurture it as a as a youth coach uh, by not allowing them to think about the negative give them that one positive thought front shoulder or lower half or hit your right. pitch you know just that nugget that that keeps you focused on that that next pitch um that's huge and you know my dad was was great at that uh, i love the big moment uh, because it was just, it was always the next pitch. There, there was no consequence for, for the last one. We're moving on. There was no time okay. to think about the negative. I love that. Um, right. Well, tw uh, 2011, uh, we can't, we can't just jump over it. Uh, All star game. Uh, this is, this is, 13 years in the making since you got drafted, and uh, in 2011, when you got that phone call unpack that moment for us yeah i mean i think uh, probably super special for for anybody you know <laughs> even when you make a, a all-star team when you're a little kid like you're like heck yeah you know um so it doesn't change when you're in your 20s and 30s uh but but obviously way more special for me it was almost it was almost a year to the day um in 2010 like right Right around the All Star break, I got the Phillies released me. So I went from 2010 All Star break getting released and not having a job, to fast forward a year and you know getting a getting called in Bosa's office and being told I was a major league All Star. You want to talk about if someone tells you that a year earlier, you're like, yeah, it's a good one, you know. So uh, yeah, super amazing. Like couldn't believe it. Um, but but growing up, I was. I was the kid that watched the all-star game. Um, I have memories of watching the guys get introduced and tipping their cap, you know? So that was the first thing that I went to was like, holy crap, like I'm going to get to be one of those guys that stands on the line and tip their cap, you know? And um, yeah, pretty amazing moment, man. Pretty amazing. I have a lot of questions from our listeners about uh, Bochi and you both spent a lot of time with Boch, So um, uh, uh, Chopper, I'll let you have the floor first, maybe, uh, just, you know, your, your favorite thing about, about, uh, Boach. I, the one thing that stood out to me was, I mean, there's a ton, he's a hall of famer, uh, but he did a really good job. I remember my first year in that clubhouse, I took a lot of notes cause I was like, dude, I'm so blessed to be in here. I'm around the best baseball minds in the world. And I called it my baseball Bible. And I like filled up a notebook with just things that I learned from coaches and players and how they went about their business every day. And uh, the one of the big things from Boach, that, especially that first year, is he wouldn't show guys when he was frustrated. If he was frustrated with our guys, he would leave the dugout, go upstairs, and his office was right next to where we had replay, me and Pop. And then he would and he'd let it fly. And he got really good, with, creative with his cuss words. Like it was, <laughs> he'd do some combinations you don't hear too often. But then he'd get it out, and then he'd go back down as that calm, just kind of captain of the ship. Um, and so, yeah, there, there's a number of things, but one thing that stood out with me with Boach was that was like, he, he would not show it if he was frustrated. Uh, Bogey, what about you? Yeah. I mean, same thing, you know, um, could play, 
possibly be one of the best of all time, where he's one of the best of all time at this point, just probably going to get better. Um, but just the way he, he manages people, um, you know, I think one of the things that makes him really good is that he understands he, that he has 25 or it's 26 now, 26 different personalities, and he has to handle them all differently. And I think he's a very good uh, person reader. He understands who needs chewed out, who needs tapped on the back, who needs kicked in the butt, you know, who needs uh, called in the office when no one else is around so they don't know that he's, you're getting chewed out, but just very, very good at knowing what people need to help them succeed. And, I mean, I'll say it all the time. He handled me perfectly um, my entire career. I mean, when I at 2011, like, I would get so mad because he would take me out of games, you know, like three to one or three to two with a man on second. And then I would come out and go, oh, he doesn't want me to lose. Uh, he didn't want me to take the L after I had pitched a really good game. And then, you know, say someone pumps a two-run homer off you and all of a sudden now you're the losing pitcher, right? Or you're on, you're on the record to, have to get the loss. So, you know, early in 2011, like he did a really good job of just managing my confidence and going, all right, I'm going to keep him in, I'm going to keep him in a good spot. He had a good game. Let's get him out before it gets sideways here. You know, let's keep him rolling. And then the more I showed him that I was okay, then he started letting me go. And all of a sudden that guy on second with two outs and a six, and it's a one run game. He wasn't taking me out anymore. So he managed me great. And then also at the end of my career, when, you know, stuff was going away a little bit and that's when you were around and, you know, the nights he saw that I was okay, he would let me ride. And the nights he was like bogey's, you know, his 39 year old body's working the way a 39 year old does. And we're going to try and get five out of him and get him out of here, you know? Um, so yeah, he, I, I thought he handled me and, and I thought he handled our entire pitching staff. I mean, about as good as you, you could, um, Obviously, we had some donkeys running out there, but he uh, he was the master of of knowing what people needed, and he still is. Beautiful. Uh, I, I got to hear at least once a month, Chopper, your your Boach impersonation. Give me give me that story there. <laughs> Chops, what do you got? And then you start talking, and he he'd be gone already. <laughs> what the? <laughs> hey, but but the thing about Boach too was he he gave that clubhouse to the players. Like that was that was their space. That was their deal. And every once in a while, he'd time it up where he would come in and, and give a speech if he felt like the boys needed it. But 99.9% .9 of the time, he just let the boys have their clubhouse. And uh, and he trusted them. that. And we had some incredible leaders. I mean, you can go up and down that clubhouse. It was filled with just incredible men. Um, but yeah, but Boach gave the boys their, their clubhouse. Dude, and, that, and that's another skill he had, Bogey, that uh, yeah. you could probably speak to, too. It was It was y'all's. But like I said, you know, when, when he thought we needed kicked in the rump, yep. he came in there and wasn't afraid to, to let everybody know who the, who the Hefe was, you know, mm -hmm. and that he was, he expected more out of us. Um, yeah. So yeah, yeah. It was, or, or it was just, uh, you know, hey, we're getting ready to run the gauntlet here. Just, I know you guys know, but I'm just reminding you, like, we're getting ready to go through a tough stretch. Like, I'm going to need all of you guys to lock it in for the next 10 days. Yeah. You know, and then we'll take a breather. But uh, yeah, it just seemed like his timing was always pretty darn good. Oh man, I uh, we've had a lot of those uh, those leaders on this podcast, and I always ask this question. I'll start with you again, Chopper. What was the secret sauce? Uh, three rings in five years. Um, I, from the outside looking in, I mean, the lineup didn't look like the twenty seven Yankees, but you guys are winning four to three, three to two. You're winning World Series rings year after year. Was there secret sauce in that clubhouse? For me, and, and this is kind of cool because I've been in two clubhouses at that level, and and one's the Dodgers and one's the Giants. And the main difference, uh, it was almost like, not to say that the Giants clubhouse during the year was uh, stressed in any way. It wasn't. Uh, it was a really good vibe. We would always have to win leading up to the playoffs. And we would win. But then the second we punched our ticket in Vogue, I would love for you to speak to this too. This was y'all's third time around. It was my first in 14, but like I've never been in a clubhouse. That's more calm. The second the playoffs started, it was like, Oh yeah, this is where we belong. They shouldn't have let us get in and we're going to do whatever it takes. And it might be a different guy every night, but we're going to win the ball game that night. And no matter what happens, 
I remember being down four, four to one, you know, in the world series um, at our, our place. And we ended up blowing out the best bullpen in baseball uh, 11 to four. And it was like, Oh yeah, that, that this is what we do. So it was this quiet, no one said it out loud, but we mm-hmm. had a quiet confidence that, Oh, we, they shouldn't have let us get in. We, we just won our third world series in five years. And it yeah. was, it was real. It was, speak to that calmness dude like where where did that come from well i think a lot of that came from boats you know you never saw boats get too high and too low and he always rode that middle line like you're trying to ride two i think i think honestly like we all liked each other i mean you know it's it's hard to have 25 guys all like each other and i'm not saying we didn't have our moments where somebody did something that got on your nerves like having 24 brothers you know but um, you, you you saw it like a lot of the nights we were all going to dinner together, you know, and uh, we actually enjoyed being around each other. And I think that made us respect each other where we didn't deal with a whole lot of garbage crap going on in the clubhouse because you had respect for the people next to you and you just didn't do dumb stuff to make anyone mad. But at the same time, like what you're talking about in 14, like we just, I think we kind of just knew what, what it what it was going to take for us to win and panicking and panic situations isn't it you know we're just like hey we're going to keep playing our game and we're going to make plays on defense we're going to execute when we're supposed to execute and at the end of the day we'll be on the top and uh you know i i think a lot of that came from 2012 when we were down two nothing going into cincinnati and then down three one in st louis and came back from both of those and most of the guys were repeating 14. I think once we did that, we were kind of like, there isn't really anything that we can't accomplish as long as we're all pulling on the same rope. And I think, I know you saw it like one of the biggest reasons why I think we won is because no one cared who the hero was on a day, on a nightly basis in the postseason. It was just about winning that game. We didn't care if you hit a, who hit the home run, you know, Brandon Crawford would lay down a bunt so the next guy could, and if he hit the home run and got to be the hero, great. We didn't care. As long as it said Giants more than the other team, that's all that mattered. Yeah, in 2012, y'all learned that uh, you had a superpower, that you could come back. Yes. And that's something I shared with our, our 10 and 11-year-olds. We were down 9 nothing in a championship game a few weeks ago. And, I mean, it was, Bogey, it was a wrap. It, we weren't playing well. It wasn't going to start playing well. I was going to clear the bench and get – make sure everyone got in at bat. And yeah. I was taking notes to make sure that I could pick spots to tell the guys how much I love them. And I'm thankful to be their coach. Cause I wanted them to know, even if it's not going our way, it doesn't change my love for you. And it's an unconditional right. love and joy and gratitude as your coach. And then all of a sudden our two subs that came in drew walks. And then we got a few hits. We put up seven in the fifth. It's only six in a game and three in the six to walk them off. And I told the kids the next day at practice, I was like, boys, this is the scary thing is now y'all know you can do it. And once you know it ain't over till it's over, you have a superpower now. And yeah. it's real. Yeah. And it's real. So, uh, no, the boys learned it in 12 when the rest of the world thought it was done. And Hunter Hunter goes all reverend on on, uh, on the boys. And, yeah, uh, yeah, you're right. And 14 and ball game, like I said, dude. And, and I think you're right, Bogey. I think you hit the nail on the head of you almost have to experience it um, because – I'm still kind of racking my head with the Dodgers of like every postseason, dude, it's on paper. It's the best team, but then it gets to a point where in that clubhouse there's stress and it's like, we know we're the best team. We have to win. And at the major league level, even in the regular season, there's not a big difference between the best and the worst team, but in the postseason, dude, there's really not a difference. And everyone's hot because they did something to get in. Right. And if you're not, if you're not calm, letting it kind of come to you, um, it gets tricky, but like, dude, the Dodgers have the same vibe as the Giants in the sense of there are no egos. They're yeah. all really good dudes, but they haven't learned or experienced what you're speaking of where y'all went through it and you learned that you had a superpower and there was nothing that was going to stop you. Yeah. And I, I, I think the other thing was we knew that we weren't going to beat ourselves. We knew we, yeah. we were just going to play fundamental baseball, right? We were going to make the plays we were supposed to yeah. make. If someone lays out and dives and gets one in the gap, bonus points, right? Um, but just we knew we were going to make the play 
plays we were supposed to make. We were going to execute getting bunts down. We were going to hit and run and execute that. We were going to execute baseball plays. And I think we that gave us confidence, like, hey, something's going to happen, and we're going to out-execute the other team. Whether, you know, like 12, when, when we, we ran a relay in the left field corner and threw Prince Fielder out at home plate, like, just ran it perfectly, you know, like just did the little things baseball wise that just kind of trumped everything else. You know, us getting down three bunts and then hitting a run and stealing was, it was trumping a two run homer. Um, it, yeah. It, and it's it, for our coaches, it's that, that are listening. It's pitching and defense. It's pitching and defense. Don't fall into that trap of we're just going to pull and we're going to swing it. We're going to swing it. No, dude, if you can hold the other team, I talk about a lot with my young group, like, Avoid crooked numbers. Like if we give yeah. up one, great. Like we'll, they'll score one, we'll score three. But try to avoid crooked numbers and really, really practice the fundamentals. Practice your relays. For practice sure. with your pitchers. Like we do flat grounds every day. Every time we throw catch, we play catch, we finish with 10 pitches from the stretch and flat ground. And it's, I want everyone to know that they can come to a balance point, separate on time and execute a strike. For sure. You know? For sure. Good. Ball game. I, I, yes. I always, I highlight little phrases that come to mind and i mean sense of calm no egos quiet confidence creative cussing yes uh, <laughs> nobody cared who the hero was um it, it, uh, all of these things preparation breeding confidence i mean there's the secret sauce right there um and and boach boach needs to be in there somewhere too we yeah, we yeah, always the rangers there there you go we always end our uh our time together with, with just a, a little trivia contest uh, uh, so that it'll be you against Chopper in, uh, in Vogue trivia. But before we get to it, Chopper, anything, uh, any other questions on your end? No, dude, I'm good. Uh, thank you for taking the time, uh, Vogie. Like I said, this has been something that from day one, like we had Jay Smooth on early and I'm like, I got to get Vogie on dude. Cause your story is, is so powerful. So we haven't seen a lot of each other, dude, but just know that how much love that my family has for you and your family. And we're really thankful you took the time today. And dude, you're going to help a lot of people because your story is powerful. Your mindset is powerful. Um, and so, yeah, thank you for taking the time. And I'm excited to get waxed by you right now for this uh, trivia. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for having me, man. Like I told you when, when you text me, like anything for you, bro, anything. Yeah. Um, and, and my feelings are the same way. Your, your family is top notch, man. And uh, I feel very, very blessed that you're in my life, bro. Change, too, you know, bro. change, change a lot of a lot of things for me and situations and a lot of people. So, very blessed that we got to cross paths and very blessed to call you a friend. The hype guy, as you called me when we won the World Series yeah. on the bus. This is our hype guy. That's hype right. Man. That's so good. So good. Uh, uh, Jock would say, "I need a dig me sesh, right, Chopper? Give me yeah. a dig me sesh." Oh yeah. Yes. Oh, I mean, uh, Jock in the in the in the video room, dude. The cheese. Yep. Yeah. No. Well, yeah, I, I'll I'll jump on board, too. And it, just being able to have a good chat with Chopper on a weekly basis, I, I'm i just in a much better place mentally uh, being around him. So at a boy. Hey, we're coming yeah. out there, Bogey, by the way. Yeah. We clinched it with Frenchie. We're going to come out there. We're going to golf with you guys. Uh, um, and we're going to do a sandlot out there. So that'll be coming this summer. Let's do it. It's going to be sick. It's done. I'll you probably bring the whole fam. Kids. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Frenchie's already he's on board. Uh, Jay Smooth is there, so it'll be a it'll be a party. Um, yes, for sure. Let's go. Most at bats. What what hitter faced you the most uh, in the MLB? Uh, Forty two abs. Oh, huh. your instinct is right. It's definitely NL West. NL West. Yeah. First guy to answer. Is that a Rocky? Wins. Incorrect. Uh, no, it is not a Rocky. Okay. All right. It's a Dodger. Ooh. Uh, Gonzalez. Close. Adrian Gonzalez. Cl close, but close. no no stogie for Vogie. Matt, Matt Kim. <laughs> Correct. Like One it. nothing. One okay. nothing. Matt Bang. Kim. I wasn't, sure. I wasn't sure if it was uh, I wasn't sure if it was him or Ethier. And I just rolled the dice with Matt Kemp. Yep. And you can say more than one, dude. So if you're not sure, you can just rapid fire it till we hit it. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yep. One nothing. Uh, Shouldn't have told you Bogey. that. Shouldn't have told him that. Who who got the most knocks off you? Most hits. 15 uh, hits. Ethier. 
D back. Negative. Ooh. It was uh, Chris Young. Good guess. Yeah. Uh, DJ Upton. Uh, nope. No, Justin Gold- Upton. Justin Upton. His nope. brother, Goldschmidt. Goldie. I get the point. Nope. It's Aaron Hill. Aaron oh. Hill. Oh. Who was say next? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, Aaron, he, he was a thorn in my side. Yep, dude. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Aaron Hill. I, I so, didn't have a very good success with little Aaron. Aaron Hill got you. bottom of the lineup too, house. dude. Golly. <laughs> yeah, he didn't. He didn't bite on those cutters. Chop. He shot that cutter to right field on me. That was that was that was a thing. I couldn't get he, him to fight that cutter. Dude. He wouldn't roll. He wouldn't roll over on the cutter, dude. Try to hit it. Get, get him to hit it to crawl. Then I would just try to sink him in. He'd clip me in the left field corner, and I'm just like, whatever, bro. Yeah, take the hit to right. Take the <laughs> well, single that, to right, dude. That, that's, that's, that's Chopper's. Cutter. That's Chopper's fault. You you got to find that video, Chopper. You gotta you gotta give him that. Yeah, dude, I, it's on me. I'll take that. <laughs> hey, so play A was always get him to hit it to cross. So initially, start with the cutter. See if yeah. they'll roll over it. You hit it to crawl. That's a wrap. That's an out. Yeah. You got two. Um, you got two chances: cutter and then sinker on the knuckles. And he did. He didn't bite on either of them. <laughs> uh most Aaron punchies who, who'd you punch out the most which pitcher did i face the most <laughs> oh no 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 so so not as a hitter as a as a, you're the pitcher what batter did yep. you yep. did you yep. punch the most not a, he's saying it could have been a pitcher that faced him but oh that's um, funny oh my bad it's a position player okay uh, um, the, the, I, I believe his name has been said Justin Upton. Justin Correct. Upton. Correct. Justin yeah, he got it. Upton. He said it first. Yep. Um. Yeah, well, you've already won, but three one, nothing. One, yeah. One final question. You had one career dinger. It was at Coors Field. What yeah. count? What was the count? Ooh, two zero. I'm gonna go o o. Ambush o o. Bang. Let's go. It was the I... first pitch wow. i mean that's what that's love what it. stat head's got it's got a first pitch oh oh count bang yeah do you remember Could that happen. pitch yeah watch can, out can you see I it do he tried he tried to he tried to stick the 86 cheese by the rat <laughs> yeah rat said nope the 86 yeah. cheeser ball wasn't working that's going out he was getting everybody yeah. else out but he didn't know 86 was my hidden speed <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Heads up for batted balls in left field. Yep. Well, <laughs> yeah. Vogie, you get the win, so you get a clipping of uh, Chopper's beard. Chopper, you you have his yeah. address, so Ace. just, just send, send that it. in. Yeah. Uh, give wait. me one of the few, one of the brown ones. Yeah. 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 Please. <laughs> uh, great. Hey, how's your how's your golf? Hey, how's your golf game? And how is uh, how's the weight room? Because we had a long chats or long chats where you would say like. Hey, as soon as I retire, bro, uh, I'm I'm getting like I'm going full John Cena. Like I'm getting stuck on yeah. swole. So I'm still going. I worked out before I got on here with you. So a boy. I'm still crushing it. Golf Good. game man is like a peaks and valleys like my pitching. Like yeah. really good, really bad. But yeah, my really good's a lot better than it used to be. You know, really good for me now, 75, 76. Strong. But my bad and my bad ones are, you know. 83 84 that's so, clean dude yeah, yeah i'll take that better. it's getting better 75 would be awesome i'd take yeah. a 75 love yeah. that great seeing you dude just, yeah you too man i love you love you too bro great meeting you vogie thanks, hey, for, thanks uh, for having me guys just, uh, thanks for coming crazy. on and we'll see you in georgia uh with with 100 kids that's can't wait bring- <laughs> all our love to your family dude all right, you too. Somebody said, "What up? See you, dude. Later. See you. Later. Awesome, awesome. Vogue, dude. Uh, what a legend. I'll, I'll say it again. Uh, you know these things that uh, that I highlighted. Smellovision. I mean, that was awesome. Um, exuded perseverance, which he did. Uh, intentional mindset to be a servant. That was that was your play. Uh, Two way player, Dave Rigetti, Cal Ripken Jr. Front shoulder, do something different. I like that line. Um, it, just just a great one. So, uh, Chopper, uh, what was your highlights of that uh, chat? 
Bogey, Bogey was, uh, he's a dude that you could count on. Like you knew he was going to be prepared. You knew that he was going to give you everything that he had on, on that day. Um, and so there's a confidence that comes along to that as his teammate, as someone that's in his corner in staff. Like we knew like, oh, Vogie's going like, you're going to have to freaking beat this dude. He is not going to beat himself. Um, and he's prepared. And that's, that's a big deal in a clubhouse. When you know you can count on a dude that he's doing it right. He's coming in. And, and like I said, you know, right away, like I would screw up sometimes and I would say hi to Vogie on game day. And he would just give me that look of like, not today, you freaking moron. <laughs> and I would love it because I would be filled with so much love of like, yep, Bogey's ready, bro. Like Bogey's freaking ready. So yeah, I was uh, a special dude, man. A special dude. We talk basketball. We talk life. Um, yeah, just just loved my time with Bogey. And I'm excited to see him uh, this summer for sure. Bang. Well, I can't wait to, to get over to Georgia. Uh, Jay Smooth, Frenchie. Uh, Vogi, you, me, I mean, that might be the best day ever. So, uh, get ready, Georgia. Um, folks, I, uh, my, my online course, the coach ball game playbook, it drops March 20 or like 21 day countdown. Now it'll, it'll happen right here in this room. And, uh, I am using every day to build this course out, uh, PDFs and, uh, an outline, uh, to fill up six good hours. So uh, tell all your your friends, all your assistant coaches uh, that this is this is a tool pouch filler right here. We're going to fill your tool pouch with all sorts of uh, psychology and uh, uh, nuggets. So uh, fired up for that, my man. A anything uh, on your end before we close up shop? Yeah, we said uh, Kike and Belly, but cross sign too with the Cardinal. So oh, uh, pending a physical cross. Cross going to St. Louis, which is awesome. Yeah, so great that's, baseball that's town. a big deal. That's a great baseball town, great fans. And then I've got eight sessions of Chad Chop Baseball Camp coming up this summer. Dates are still be de to determ uh, be determined, but TBD. Um, it's going to be eight. TBD, it's going to be eight weeks uh, of, of fun. And, you know, uh, just throwing a baseball party where you try to learn one thing a day and have a ton of fun. So we're, uh, we're really excited for that. I'll get the dates out here once – once we lock them in, buddy. Yeah, sure beats uh, the kids on their iPad all day. That's for sure. Um, go get That's it done. Uh, same out here in Southern California, Orange County. Nine weeks of summer camp. All the boys will be there. Flicky's coming down. Pterodactyl. Uh, and I'm going to get some content out, too, uh, of all of my assistant coaches so you can get to know them a little bit. Um, the Sandlot yeah. Tour starting to crank up as well. So, uh, Chopper, as much as you can get on a – on a flight and and join me um, i'm dialing in those dates and we got 10 confirmed dates i'll probably do 40 total uh in 2024 so the first one is in simi valley march 27 and then we hit saint paul minnesota uh early april so giddy up baby it's gonna be a good year risky in april like that could be 70 and that could be 30. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's, I like it. That, You're rolling the dice. The, I love that's it. That's why the contract uh, states indoor facility <laughs> yeah. uh, at, is a must before we book. Yes. Gotta have the indoor love facility. Uh, love, love you, that. brother. Fine print. Always love, you too, love our Tuesdays. Have a great week. Don't forget to rake. Hey, don't forget to wake and rake. You're on the YouTube. Wake and rake. Wake, wake and rake. And a random act of kindness every day. That's a great That's all it is. Bang. I need it. Thanks, buddy. Bye.